Hello and welcome to my channel and welcome to Doctor Who Review Season 9 Episode 11 Heaven Sent. As usual if you haven't watched the episode already please do so before watching this review and for this episode I really really mean it more than ever because this is one episode you do not want spoiled. I'll give you slightly longer to stop the video if you need to before we go on. And thank you very much to Maximus Hornet for that rather new extended title sequence. And so we come to the second part of the Doctor Who three part finale. And possibly the first episode since Tom Baker's The Deadly Assassin that the Doctor has been companionless, deliberately companionless. I may be wrong. So we, before we pull apart the episode completely, let's recap the story. The Doctor, from the end of Face the Raven, gets teleported to God knows where. Turns out to be inside a castle. Doctor's first words when he comes out of the uh, teleporter tube is a direct threat to whoever put him there that if they had anything to do with Clara's death that he would find them and that he would never ever stop. He then goes on to explore the castle and finds many anomalous things including being stalked very very slowly and very very silently by the veil a creature we never really see clearly hence the name the veil because all you see is the cloak and the doctor is powerless his greatest weapon well his greatest weapons have been taken from him he's there weaponless and unarmed and his greatest other weapon to run away is also removed from him because he's inside a prison there is nowhere to escape to and the castle itself reconfigures itself every now and again so the corridors that were open suddenly become closed doors suddenly have brick walls behind them where they used to have rooms and the doctor figure, um, follows a, a series of clues that seem to be left for him including an open or a, a freshly dug grave which when he digs down he finds a stone that says I am in 12. He then spends we don't know how long searching for room 12. Each time he's cornered by the veil he has to confess his um, fears. He has to reveal things about himself that nobody knows. And it's all leading up to this hybrid thing that's been following through the through the series. Now, when it comes to night time, he looks in the stars and uh, realizes he's been transported seven thousand years into the future. But he claims himself that he knows he's not time travelled. We're presented with mystery upon mystery upon mystery. We never within the episode we're never given any more information than the Doctor has himself. Strangely enough the end of the episode occurs about halfway through the episode when the Doctor finally gets into room 12 having revealed his last confession only to be faced with an Asbantium wall 20 feet thick and he explains that Asbantium I think I've pronounced that right is 400 times tougher than diamond so it's an impenetrable wall but he only has one last confession left to get through and that's the one confession he can't say he can't reveal and that is the truth about the hybrid so he decides to punch his way through it the pain in our I winced every time he punched that and of course the veil eventually catches up with him and kills him leaves him powerless to regenerate 
He then spends a day and a half crawling up the stairs and down the corridors till he gets to the transporter room. And as we know, a new copy is made when he sacrifices his old life. Sacrifice again. Sacrifices his old life to make the new copy and repeat the cycle over and over again for thousands of years. And we get to see the repeats. The most important repeat is the first one I found. When he steps out of the trans... The, the, when he re-exits the transporter pod and says to whoever's listening, if you have anything to do with Clara's death, I am coming to find you and I will never, ever stop. And suddenly that that speech took on a whole new connotation. What seemed like a frivolous threat suddenly becomes so painful to watch because he isn't. He's being forced to relive over and over and over again. Okay then, the first point that I really liked was the script. So let's talk about the script for a minute. Well, I've already mentioned one, the fact that the speech he gives at the beginning of the episode takes on a whole new connotation when we see him emerge for the second time from the transporter pod. It takes on a whole new emotional level. And the second thing about the script, I mean, the script was fantastic from beginning to end. But... I really loved the fact that him looking up at the stars and saying, if I didn't know better, I'd say I'd travelled X amount of years into the future, comes directly before the scene where he's punching the wall and he exclaims, and the shepherd boy says how many seconds are in eternity or the emperor asks how many seconds are in eternity and then we get the next run through and then we see if I didn't know better I'd say I'd travelled 600,000 years into the future and then we get the scene of him punching the wall and saying how many seconds in eternity it, the script really wanted to drum, drum home the fact that despite the fact that he was personally living all those years it was only the blink of an eye in reality the second point was the story itself the Grimm Brothers story because we only heard the doctor mention a tiny little portion of the story and this is very important because elements of that story were or clues in that story were all over the place but weren't directly mentioned and that is in the original Grimm story the Emperor asks the shepherd's boy who is known far and wide for his wisdom the Emperor doesn't believe that a, 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 a mere shepherd boy could be that wise so he calls him to his palace and says if you can answer my three questions I will recognize you as my heir as the wisest person in the land and the first question he asks the boy is how many drops of water are in the ocean and of course we see the endless ocean that surrounds the doctor's prison the ocean plays a very big part in his revelation of what is exactly going on the, the skulls in the ocean the skull falling into the water um, the second question the Emperor asks is how many stars are in the night sky well of course the stars and the sky are extremely important in the story for the Doctor to realise what is exactly is going on. The stars offer the realisation of how many years are passing, how many times he's gone through this loop. And of course, the last one, how many seconds are in eternity? And then the shepherd's boy says, there's a diamond mounting in 
Lower Pomerania. That is one and a half miles wide, one and a half miles high, and one and a half miles deep. It takes an hour to go round it, an hour to go around it, over it, or something like that. <laughs> and every hundred years, a little bird, blah, 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 blah. We know the rest. Uh, they, they all play a major part in the telling of this wonderful story. The second point I'd like to bring to your attention is the music. Now, I don't normally specifically mention Murray Gold's music. I'm a big fan of TV and film composers. I spend a long time listening to a lot of uh, film scores and TV scores. And to be quite honest, I find Murray Gold perfectly acceptable for the style of uh, program that he writes music for. Nothing to write home about, sometimes a little bit frivolous. On the whole, quite enjoyable. Not this time, oh my god no. Murray Gold has pulled out all the stops in this episode. His music has never been better. I heard elements of Beethoven's seventh, of Schubert's eighth. I heard elements of Mendelssohn. His music was emotional. It wasn't overpowering, but it really added character to the whole episode. I almost feel as though Murray Gold's music in this episode was a, a, an actual character within the story. It was that important and that dramatic and that emotional it really pushed the story forward um i could go on for ages i really hope he releases it very very soon because i'd like to find out the titles of these but two tracks within the episode really stand out now as i said i don't know what he's actually titled his tracks but they've been given on youtube the nicknames eternal torment and breaking the wall um, and you'll know the um, breaking the wall obviously is the music that comes um, as he says the line no more no more stories this time I'm going to tell you the truth to the veil at that last when he's facing the wall eternal torment is the music that he's playing as he um, explains about the transporter being a 3D printer when he's dragging him battered and burnt self back to the transporter room at the end of the sequence those two stand out as not just brilliant pieces of music but I believe I believe that those pieces could stand out in the years to come on their own And then there's Peter Capaldi's acting throughout this episode. Now we've all known that Peter Capaldi's been in the business for years. He knows his trade, he's a good actor. But I never realised how good. I said that about Maisie Williams in The Girl Who Died, that I'd never realised how good an actress she had become. But Peter Capaldi I don't know how he done this episode. I mean, we hear about... Right. When I first saw Castaway, I know it's got a beginning and an end that feature quite a high cast, but for the majority of the film, Tom Hanks is acting on his own. And when I first heard about this film, I thought, oh my God, Tom Hanks could never pull that off. He's a good comic actor. He's hilarious, but... A role as serious as that, as emotional as that, there's no way he can do that, not on his own. I was proved wrong then, and well, even though I didn't say that of Peter Capaldi, I thought it. I thought no way could he pull a, an episode like that off. And he did. He did as well as Tom Baker did in Deadly Assassin. And De in Deadly Assassin, he was only companionless. He wasn't actually on his own in the episode. But Peter, 
Peter Capaldi, apart from one small speech from Jenna Louise Coleman towards the end of the episode, Peter Capaldi was the only person talking in that, this episode. And yet he carried, carried it so well that I was amazed. I was brought to tears, literally moved to tears, not because I was sad, but because his acting and, and the, the music and the whole episode just, I just felt, uh, I, I can't explain it. It just got to me. It got to me bad. So, in summary, an absolutely brilliant, emotionally charged and truly terrifying, psychologically terrifying episode. I say psychologically terrifying because when I when I rewatched this, because I watched other people's reactions after I'd done my own, and it kind of got everybody in the same way, and that is knowing that he was repeating that sequence for a million years, six, 60 million years, 52 million years. I got it quite badly wrong when I was watching the episode. Um, the fault of having the TV too low. I misheard a few a few years but it didn't it didn't stop me uh, stop the impact of it having an effect on me and when I went to think about that afterwards I thought the concept of having to live the same sequence over and over and over again for what was it two over two billion years that's an inconceivable amount of time that is longer than well that is just about the same amount you know if you, if you went on, on earth time you're talking about single celled life forms living in the ocean you know that's as far as life had got on earth at that point two billion years you can't you can't even imagine that that is hell in any whether you're religious or whatever religion you are everyone's got a concept of the ultimate hell the ultimate torture and that is it Stephen Moffat really hit a psychological nerve with this episode and that was his intention I, I read an interview with him and he stated that he'd actually written the ending of Heaven Sent before he'd even looked at any other scripts before he'd written anything else he already had an idea of what this episode was going to be and I think it shows I think it shows that this whole series has kind of branched out from the concept of this episode there is not much to dislike about this episode some found it boring or confusing but I didn't find it so I think if you watch it a couple of times you kind of really get the gist of what's going on um, so in summary top five moments the fact that the script could work differently on rewatching the episode the whole monologues took on a whole different context that is the art of a real good clever script so I loved that. I loved the ending, the big reveal, um, the fact that he was inside his confession dial, and that he was in on in fact on Gallifrey. And wow, was that a moment! Oh my God, I, I my head nearly exploded. It just bang, Gallifrey yes ah the moment we've been waiting for number three top favorite moment is the veil himself or itself if the concept of him repeating that sequence over and over again for eternity what seemed like eternity wasn't scary enough the concept of the vow forever stalking him never speaking never never answering a question 
never given a motive just constantly stalking him that's scary in anyone of course mind. of course of course the veil itself is a euphemism for death so it's death forever stalking him and finally catching him at the end because who can escape death and that's that's a theme that we've had throughout this finale is inevitability we had the inevitability of the quantum shade that would never stop would if your number was up it would hunt you wherever you went whenever you went we've got the inevitability of death stalking the doctor the inevitability of him having to repeat the same sequence of events over and over again and a lot of people have asked why did he repeat surely at some point in the course of two billion years he would have done something differently but i think that's the point he always he always did the exact thing that he needed to do and that was always going to be the same his mind was always going to be locked into that one course of action and what else did i like about this episode yes the mind palace the fact that the doctor retreats into his own mind in times of danger in order to introspectively think about the problem and the, the fact that he's on board the tardis with his current assistant um i think if he if it had been matt smith in this episode we would have seen Amy and it wouldn't have been a chalkboard because that's particular way of communicating between the 12th Doctor and Clara we saw it in last Christmas uh, we've seen it a lot the fact that they communicate via the chalkboard so I enjoyed that theme but the fact that he was keeping her memory alive that that was it was like it was that was his focal point we find out that later that that was his focal point for carrying on for not revealing that last confession was keeping Clara's memory alive figuring out a way to to save her and I, I love the idea of the mind palace I don't know where that phrase came from but it, it, it perfectly describes it um, and I think we all have we all have that mind palace don't we in times of quiet introspection that place where we retreat to the place in our minds where we're most comfortable and of course it's going to be the TARDIS for the Doctor so I loved that even though it was rather confusing the way it was thrown it in at us I think I think they did well to explain it without over explaining it on the whole a really really fantastic episode absolutely my top favourite of the season so far we've only got one episode left so I don't class the Christmas specials as part of the season I consider them separate so as far as the season goes we've got one episode left hellbent we're on Gallifrey apparently and we're gonna find out what the finale to this great symphony of TV is gonna be until then I thank you for watching I hope you'll watch my channel further but <laughs> if you like this video hit the like and subscribe etc etc blah de blah de blah thank you very much I'll see you soon bye bye